This, of course, would be a very low form of life, uh, well, not intelligent life. Uh, yes, uh, probably not intelligent life. But it need, it need not be a low in the biological sense. It might be pretty sophisticated to have adapted itself to that environment. What about the concern that some uh, scientists have shown around the world, and indeed our own people are showing, about the astronauts bringing back uh, some, uh, a, a bug, a yeah. virus of some kind from, from the moon? Yes, the, the question of uh, back contamination. It's, it's very unlikely, but they are taking precautions against this. It's hard to know what precautions are adequate when you're, one deals with a very improbable event, which, if it does occur, may be very disastrous. You're multiplying an enormously large number by a very small number. How much money should one invest into this um, quarantine arrangement? And um, Now, the intention is, in case uh, some of our audience doesn't know, when they come back, they're going to be quarantined. The equipment is all built. They're going to be uh, put into quarantine as soon as they get out of the spacecraft and kept in the quarantine. That same uh, quarantine capsule is going to be transported with them right on back to Houston, and they'll be in it for uh, 18 days. 21 I days, 21 I think. days, yes. yeah, total uh, time before they come out, uh, which is believed to be adequate enough for any life forms that they may have picked up on the moon to become apparent. Yes, a again, great... it's uh, hard to judge because that's the incubation period of most of the infectious uh, epidemic diseases on Earth, but of course, if other diseases exist, how long would they take to incubate? Yeah. And uh, and uh, since we don't haven't built up any immunity to these things, I, uh, we we might be wiped out by uh, a bug from the moon that we haven't even identified. It's very unlikely because anything there would be so specialized, it probably wouldn't enjoy us in the least. It's, we can even say it's the stuff of which science fiction is made. A lot of science fiction has been made of this. <laughs> It's just past 5.01 now, Arthur. It's coming up really on yes. 5.02. We haven't heard from the spacecraft, so we can assume that they have burned that service propulsion system engine. At least they got some burn out of it, and they have slowed up to a certain extent. They certainly haven't continued at 5,700 miles an hour. So uh, now we, it's a good sign, and we've got uh, another uh, uh, 10 minutes or so to, to wait uh, until we, we get some definite word that uh, everything has gone well and that uh, they are really coming around uh, with into the lunar orbit uh, that they had hoped for. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. We'll be talking to you a great deal Bye. more. If you know you're right, standing right here, right by me, for, uh, for some more words of uh, interest and of wisdom. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. We are assuming, since the spacecraft did not emerge around the moon at the moment it would, if there had been no firing of its braking rockets at this time to go into lunar orbit, that it is going into lunar orbit, uh, which would mean that uh, we will hear from it again in uh, just about uh, eight minutes from now. It should uh, come back around uh, the right-hand side of the moon as we look at the moon and be back in touch with Earth to report that it is successfully in lunar orbit. And then after about four hours or two orbits of the moon, it will fire again to go into a 69-mile high circular orbit of the moon. Right now, its orbit would be, if all has gone well, 69 miles by 195 miles, a slightly elliptical orbit uh, of the moon. The uh, rest of the schedule for the evening then would involve a, a television transmission of the moon's surface at around 9.30 tonight, a little after 9.30. Then Eugene Sermon, for the first time in this flight, climbs down into the lunar module at 10.30 tonight, Eastern Daylight Time, for a two-hour period, checking out uh, the systems of the lunar module. He climbs back into the command module, and the astronauts uh, turn in finally after a very busy day at 1.30 uh, tomorrow morning. After eight hours of sleep, the big day, when Stafford and Cernan take the lunar module down to within 10 miles of the moon's surface. Bruce Morton at the Manned Space Center in Houston. What's the mood down there right now in this waiting period? Very quiet in mission control, Walter. Uh, this has been kind of a good time flight so far. The astronauts uh, have had a lot of fun, and so have the people in mission control with the television transmissions, uh, the sights of uh, an upside-down John Young and so forth. But uh, all that's changed now, of course, with the spacecraft out of communication. Uh, there's a big crowd in mission control, along, of course, with the regular shift, the flight controllers. Uh, lots of astronauts have come in. Rusty Schweikert, who was, uh, of course, on the Apollo 9 flight. The Apollo 10 backup crew, Gordon Cooper, Don Isley, and Edgar Mitchell. 
most of the high-ranking NASA officials who are normally here and a number who are stationed elsewhere. Dr. Werner von Braun, for example, the uh, chief architect of the Saturn rocket. Dr. Kurt Debus, head of the Kennedy Space Center. Deke Slayton, chief of the astronauts' office. And uh, just a flock of executives from uh, North American and Grumman, the builders of the command and service module and the lunar module, respectively. The wives, as far as we can make out uh, on this monitor and from our pipeline into mission control, are all uh, staying at home watching this, I suppose, on television and uh, waiting uh, more anxiously than most of us to see how it comes out. I would think so, uh, probably. It's David Schumacher has been following this flight from the very beginning, keeping tabs of every uh, important uh, uh, transmission from the spacecraft and all of its maneuvers. And, David, uh, you followed all of them before this, too, in the Apollo and before that the Gemini series. Uh, uh, what's the outstanding part of this flight uh, so far in your mind? Waller, I don't have a particularly original observation, but I think you could say that it's what a difference 250,000 miles makes, uh, at least in the case of uh, this particular crew of astronauts. Uh, they are uh, a, a fairly uh, laconic bunch uh, here on the ground. Uh, Gene Cernan, uh, certainly talkative enough, but, but they're all uh, fairly sober individuals with quiet senses of humor, and uh, they, they kind of keep tight control of themselves. And to see them uh, in the past few days uh, hamming it up as they have has been uh, quite a big surprise to those who have uh, known them. It wasn't at all what we expected. It's the most talkative uh, space crew we've had in the Apollo program, certainly. They're keeping uh, the ground well advised of what they're doing, uh, and, uh, and their antics on television have been not only amusing, but informative. They have uh, insisted all along that uh, they were going to see that this time we, we on the ground uh, really shared in this experience of space flight. It wasn't at all what we expected. It's the most talkative uh, space crew we've had in the Apollo program, certainly. They're keeping uh, the ground well advised of what they're doing, uh, and, uh, and their antics on television have been not only amusing, but informative. They have uh, insisted all along that uh, they were going to see that this time we, we on the ground uh, really shared in this experience of space flight. And of course, it, because we don't really know or understand the systems and the theories and all of the things that are working for them, uh, it seems more dangerous to us than it does to the men that are involved in it. And so I suppose that part of this is an attempt to reassure us that uh, space travel really isn't such a special thing. And uh, yeah, we'll be going along in not too many more years. One of the things that, uh, that I think Tom Stafford has done for all of us and for the space program, perhaps, is this insistence on the color camera to take it along on his flight. And he really pushed for that. And it may mean, with the great success of that Westinghouse camera, that we'll get color on the moon flight, Apollo 11, which had not been scheduled up to now. You, would you agree with that, David? I would think it would be almost impossible now, wouldn't it, for NASA to resist the uh, public pressure for a color look at the surface of the moon, even if the moon is only black and white. What are we going to find out about the moon? Uh, what do we know about the moon up to now, David? Uh, Incidentally, I'm keeping tabs here. We're about uh, three minutes now from that acquisition of signal. Well, I, they should come around. I would say that uh, we must be in pretty good shape up there around the moon right now. That another one of those cases where no news is, is good news. Uh, I suggested to a, a geologist the other day that uh, perhaps we knew more about the moon in some senses than we did about the Earth. And he said that at least in one sense he would agree with that. And that is that uh, the Earth is, of course, mostly covered by water. And uh, therefore, uh, we do have a better idea of the topography of the surface of the moon. However, we don't have any idea at all of what's just underneath. Uh, we won't know that until we actually get down onto the surface. And once we do that, we'll have a pretty good idea, perhaps, of uh, the origins of the Earth, because so much of our own Earth is covered by this water. So that's what uh, I'm looking forward to. And so we, uh, we're going to get uh, some indication of that from the rock samples that they will pick up on Apollo 11. And then on future flights, uh, I think the scientific experiments include actually some drilling, uh, uh, small-scale drilling, of course, to get a little bit uh, further down than just the surface of the moon, doesn't it, David? That's right. Uh, perhaps uh, we played down a little bit too much the, uh, the tension here. It's amazing how in just one flight you can get used to the idea of being that far away and, and all that's involved. Uh, it's obviously not just a, another day like any other. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, many of the astronauts uh, we know have, have gathered at mission control. Uh, the wives 
tend to gather in little groups uh, for mutual support. Uh, and they've got about a minute and a half to wait. Uh, any second now, we could get that acquisition of signal. Of course, they could be off a little bit on the calculations there. They count on 512 as their uh, timing, of, uh, but uh, uh, such are the uh, radio waves that, of course, they can get small bounces and so forth. I suppose that they're watching very carefully now with just uh, a minute to go. You remember in, in 8, there was, in Apollo 8, there was this time where we thought we heard carrier wave. We thought we heard something out there, but uh, it wasn't yet a good enough signal to, to uh, pick up the actual voices of the astronauts. There's another thing that uh, has occurred to me... Oh, in one minute now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> another thing that occurred to me in uh, considering the, uh, their position, the spacecraft uh, is really in the sun on the far side of the moon. You have the feeling that uh, they're lost out there in the, in the deep darkness, but uh, in fact, uh, they're actually whizzing along in the bright sunlight, probably having one of the biggest thrills of their lives. 